už bloku expertů letošního semestru. A dneš, na dnešní přednášku přijala pozvání paní Marina Pančeva z RVS Moravě. Ještě než začneme, tak zase několik organizačních detailů. V podstatě stejně jako vždycky, prosím, mějte vypnuté mikrofony, protože to hrozně ruší, když se tam ozývají nějaké zvuky. A uh, opět otázky, prosím, klaďte zase do chatu, jako vždycky. Přednáška bude opět v angličtině. Otázky můžete klást jak v angličtině, tak v češtině. My je potom přednášející opět přetlumočíme, jako vždycky. Tak a uh, já už bych tímto ráda předala slovo naší přednášející. Uh, Marina, are you with us? Hey, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me well? Yes. Hello, everybody. Okay, okay so welcome. Thank you for joining us today. And um, basically, I told everything I wanted to, and the floor is yes. yours. Yes. Um, just let me share my screen, and please let me know when you can see the presentation. Give me a second. I suppose it's loading still. And it, for some reason, it started from the middle. Can you see the presentation? Yes. But yes. we can see full. Ah, yeah, now we can see it full screen. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, uh, hello everybody. I'm really pleased and honored to be invited to this uh, lecture. Uh, first of all, I like talking to students. This is something I used to do a lot before. Uh, secondly, I'm going to talk about a topic that I find very exciting myself, and it's about big data. I'm going to walk you through a couple of examples of big data and show you how big data uh, can uh, help us uh, build intelligence, and specifically how monitoring human intelligence through data can help build machine intelligence and smart processes. But before we go there, I'd like to tell you more about myself and what I'm doing so that you can see big data in a particular context. Uh, by education, I'm a theoretical linguist. I did my PhD in Norway, and then it just so happened that in 2014, I moved to the Czech Republic uh, where I started working in a localization. Um, and currently my job um, is um, focused on uh, driving a community translation project for an uh, IT giant. It's a really uh, large corporation that is uh, buying translations from the company I work for. And driving such a project is a really big thing. It has lots of aspects. For example, uh, we are managing the onboarding and training of translators, uh, the quality of the translations, whether they are delivered on time or not, the capacity of the translators, we develop tools and optimizations, and we do so much more. But I guess that you may not all have heard the word localization and you may not know what exactly it means. So let me just give you this uh, background. Localization basically means translating a product and adapting that product to a specific region. So it's not like a translation of a book, but it's more like translating a particular product and adapting it. So it has these two components. First, the translators or the localizers must convert the text from one language to another, from, for example, from English to Japanese or Czech, but that's not enough. It needs to be adapted to the locale. So um, it needs to be adapted to the market, the culture. So for example, if you have um, currency, which is in dollars, when localizing for the Czech market, you not only have to change the language from English to Czech, but also all the dollars must be localized into Czech crowns or euros or yenas or whatever. And you've all seen localization. In fact, I'm pretty sure you see it right now because I guess this is what you see. And what I see is the English teams, right? But what our translators do for you and everybody is turn it into the Czech teams. Uh, so you have all those words translated into Czech. The context menus are translated into Czech and in another almost 100 languages. And the way we do it is by using crowdsourcing. So that's the community project I work on. And crowdsourcing is currently a very modern word. word. It's being used many places because it's actually 
in place on many, many platforms, and I'm sure you know many of those platforms. Crowdsourcing is, for example, when you want to request a ride from Uber. The Uber drivers community is a crowdsource community. This means that they are not employed and they're not getting a salary and they're not working from eight to five as taxi drivers, but these are people who can pick up a job when it is available whenever they want. It's paid crowdsourcing because they get paid for that. But crowdsourcing doesn't have to be paid. It can be for free. One very good example of a successful crowdsourcing platform is Wikipedia, where uh, which has millions of contributors worldwide. So this is a crowd and these people basically share their knowledge. So it's a crowd shares knowledge. And again, it's done whenever people want, right? Nobody obliges them uh, to do so. So it's a, in a sense voluntary, but in this case, it also doesn't get paid. So there are many, many crowdsourcing platforms out there. Airbnb is another crowdsourcing platform. Uh, TaskRabbit is another one where you can find somebody to, uh, I don't know, um, assemble your IKEA furniture or um, fix the plumbing at home and again it's people who just do it on a freelance basis and the one that i am working for is called fluently and this is crowdsource localization through which everybody who needs a translation can register submit a job and then our community translators we don't call them crowd we call them community they pick up the jobs and they translate and that's how crowdsourcing, uh, crowdsource localization works. So there, is a, there are these two models. One is the classic model of providing localization, translating using translation agency. And the other one is by using translator community. Communities and crowd are kind of similar things, uh, but um, the community is more structured and much more trained. That's why we call our translators crowd translator community because they're more than a crowd. They're more structured and they've had special education and training for uh, translating what they do. Yeah, but let me talk to uh, talk you through the difference between a translation agency and a translation community. So under the classic model with a translation agency, what we have is the client. So this can be an IT giant, some corporation. It can be a, a pharmaceutical corporation who wants to translate the leaflets accompanying the medicine. Uh, and the client <clears throat> has a contract with a localization provider. There are a couple of big companies out there. I work for one of them. It's called RWS Moravia. So the client sends jobs to be translated to RWS Moravia. And under the, under the classic model, RWS Moravia, the localization provider, contracts translation agencies in every country where the language is needed and sends the job to them. So RWS Moravia gets all the jobs from the client and then distributes it to the agencies which get the work for their respective language. And what those agencies then do in turn is they take the work and distribute it to their individual translators who they contract to do the work. So there are a couple of layers there. So first client meets RWS Moravia, then RWS Moravia meets the agencies, and then the agencies actually send the work to the translators. Um, the, there is a good thing about that. And the good thing about it is that um, the um, agencies are obliged to, they, they have a contract with, with the localization provider and they need to return all the translations within a certain period, for example, within 48 hours, and they're contractually obliged to do so. So if they don't, then there's a problem for the business relationship. Um, that's the good thing. There is the safety that RWS Moravia and the client will get the translations back in time. But there's one bad thing, and the bad thing is that nobody knows who actually translates. The client doesn't know which suppliers RWS Moravia works with, which exact agencies we have a contract with. We don't know from RWS Moravia who are the actual translators who translate. And then if we are not happy about the quality of the translation, we actually don't know who, which specific translator translates badly. 
or if we are happy about the quality, we don't know who to reward more. We can just say, yeah, half of your the translations for German are good and the other half are bad, but there's nothing we can do about it except write to the German agency PM. With a community model, it's very different. So the client doesn't really send the work to RWS Moravia. The client uploads all the work, all the jobs to be translated to fluently. This is the platform. This is like Airbnb website or Uber website or the mobile app. This is a platform and the work just goes there. And from there, it directly reaches the translators. In fact, it doesn't go to translators. Translators go to fluently and pick the work up when they want. The good thing about it is that we know all those translators basically by name, uh, by the name they give us. Okay, man, not be their real name, but we know who they are exactly. And for each one of these translators, we get data and there is full transparency. But there is one bad thing. And the bad thing is that the community works with an open call model. So those translators claim the work when they want. And if they don't want, there is no contractual obligation to claim the work. So there is a big, very big element of insecurity there. Um, our WS Moravia has contractual obligation with the client to deliver all the translations within 48 hours, but the translators don't have this obligation. So there we need to smartly manage the translator community in order to make sure that the risk to miss deadlines is very, very small. It's even more complicated than that because translators not only can claim work whenever they want and if they want, they can actually also reject it whenever they like. And that's, you can imagine how difficult it is. Imagine you, you call an Uber taxi. And then the driver confirms, yes, I'm going to pick you up and drive you to the airport. And then at some point, just before you are ready to leave your house and you have packed and you are looking forward to uh, flying away to some nice place, the driver says, ah, oh, no, I'm going to reject that. I actually changed my mind. I don't want to do that. And imagine now how a project manager feels working with drivers who can confirm a ride and then reject it any moment and how one can mitigate the risk. Well, it looks really scary and it sounds really scary, but in fact, again, thanks to data and smart management, this risk can be reduced in a way that it actually will not impact the service. So there are other differences between the traditional agencies and the translators, and I'm going to show you one, uh, one more. So this is a distribution of work um, throughout the week across all the 24 hours. So the vertical um, axis, the Y axis showing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then on the horizontal axis, you see the hours from zero to 24. And you can see the work pattern of a translation agency. The black circles show you jobs that have been assigned, actually taken jobs, and the red circles are delivered jobs. And you can very clearly see the work day. The work day, which starts at around six o'clock and ends at about four in the afternoon, and the agency works from Monday to Friday, and that's it. But the work comes all the time. So this is, there are lots and lots of clients who want localization out there and they're sending jobs all the time, also on Saturday, also at eight o'clock in the evening. But the translation cannot deliver those, trans the translation agency cannot deliver those translations. But it's very different with community. And that's one of the good things about the community. This is the work coverage by the community you can see that the coverage is complete 24 seven. The community of translators claim work and deliver work anytime between Monday midnight to Sunday midnight. Of course, there is a, a part during the week with higher density. So you can see that the circles are denser and larger uh, around from Monday to Friday um, during the, I would say, European working time. But nevertheless, the coverage is complete. And this is one of the reasons why uh, crowdsource localization and community translations are so successful, despite all the risks and challenges that they bring with them.
So that's basically what I work and now I'd like to delve into um, data and how data helps us manage the community. But before that, I need to give you a better picture of how work in community uh, proceeds and what are all the scenarios that we meet there uh, and what all can happen. Really quite complicated. I am going to do that with the help of a little video um, so that I just give you the idea uh, and I hope it's going to help you understand how it all works and all the challenges that we actually meet. So in this little educational video, we start of course um, with the cloud and then we have our translators for different languages and then of course we have the client. And the client sends files and jobs and they get uploaded directly to the cloud. And the moment they hit the cloud, three clocks start ticking. Uh, so any file, any job, whenever coming to the cloud, to the platform that is fluently, gets assigned three clocks. The first clock is measuring eight, uh, 10 hours. And these 10 hours are the time within which we want the job to be claimed. So we monitor the time in which, during which the job is out there influently. And we say we wait for 10 hours for somebody to pick it up. That's the time people have to pick it up on their free will. The second clock measures 40 hours. And this is that translators have to deliver the job back, to pick it up, translate it and complete it. And 48 hours is the last clock, and this is the time that RWS Moravia and Fluently have to deliver the job back to the client. So basically we have two deadlines. One is the deadline to the client, which is 48 hours, and the other one is the deadline for the translators, which is 40 hours, and there is an eight hour buffer. And this buffer is there not only so that we are on the safe side and if something goes wrong, we still you know, can, can solve it, but also because uh, very often the jobs need some post processing, they need to be uh, finalized, so there is this extra buffer there. And under the normal circumstances, those clocks are ticking and translators pick up their jobs. They start working. Here we have translator for language circle who starts translating, translates the file, completes it, and it goes to the client and it's just perfect. But it doesn't always work like this. So we can have the files coming, right? The, um, they're uploaded to the cloud and the clocks start ticking. And the question is, what happens if the claim period hours elapses and nobody has claimed that file. There's something wrong with that file. Probably nobody wants it. Either it's too big or too small or too difficult, but nobody wants to translate it. And if nobody picks it up, then we may miss the deadline to the client. So there we have a mechanism whereby we can take that job and assign it directly to special translators called power users. Wake them up, send them this file and tell them here there's something very, very important. Can you please translate it? They typically do and still manage to deliver it within the 40, the 40 hour deadline. So we have that mechanism to ensure that files that nobody wants <coughs> get assigned to special translators with whom we have special agreement. This is called the discarded service for discarded jobs. Now there are other scenarios that we can meet in the community. For example, files get picked up, they're claimed, no problem. But here the translator, instead of starting to translate after claiming the file, actually falls asleep and doesn't touch the file for a whole lot of 40 hours. So the deadline expires for that translator and the file is still not even touched. So what do we do then with such a job? We have a mechanism which establishes, yes, now the deadline is over for the translator. The job is not touched, so by automation, this job is taken back to the cloud for somebody else to pick it up because the translator slept through the whole deadline. And then very often somebody else picks it up, translates it, and we still manage to deliver to the client within 48 hours. So that's a happy end. But the happy, the end is not always happy. So what can happen is again, we have the files coming to the cloud, the jobs, and then the translators claim them. And again, the translator, instead of starting to translate, just falls asleep and sleeps all the time until the 40 hours deadline elapses. And our automation catches that, takes the file back, 
to the cloud, but then nobody wants to claim it, right? It can be put back into the cloud, into Fluent, and still nobody will want to claim it. Uh, but we have very little time to the deadline. It's eight hours, basically. So there we have another clock, which is a one hour clock, which starts measuring time for ex especially such files, such jobs which are taken back. And if nobody claims it within one hour, then it again gets assigned to one of our dear power users who are being woken up and told there is something very important that somebody claimed and returned it. And now we ask you to translate it. They translate it and they typically manage to deliver it on time. Importantly, all of that happens through pure auto Automation. There is no human that is sending those email or monitoring that. It's a completely no touch pro process. Now we can have all of a situation that can happen. Translator picks up a file, starts translating, translates the first one quarter, and then falls asleep and sleeps through the whole deadline or wakes up a little bit before that and continues translating. But now the deadline has elapsed. However, our automation cannot take that job back and put it into the uh, into fluently into the cloud because it's partially translated. So some part of the work is done and taking it back means that this translator won't get paid even for the part of the work that is being done. So we cannot take it back by automation. What automation then does is sends an email to the translator saying you have a file here and the deadline is coming very soon. You need to hurry up and the translator understands this is priority, focuses on that translation and delivers very quickly. And the last scenario I'd like to show you is the most interesting from all. Look here, we have translators who claim files within the first 10 hours, everything is perfect, and the translator for language square delivers the file, but the translator for language circle does very unexpected. She rejects the file back. Now she rejects the file back, but we are lucky enough to have somebody else claim the file very shortly after that and translate that file and oops, I'm sorry, I misclicked somewhere, translate that file and uh, deliver back to the client. Uh, just give me a second because my slideshow froze. Yeah. I think you're seeing it now. So she translates the file and delivers it back uh, to the client and everything is fine. But the $1 million question here is, why did the first translator reject the file in the first place? Did something horrible happen and she had to rush out of the house and had to just drop everything and reject all the work? Or was the reason different? And I'm going to show you in a short while that by looking at data, we actually can answer this question. So there's no need to ask translators, why did you reject? It's enough to look at the data that is flowing in. So these are basically things that can happen in the community, and you can imagine that they don't happen one by one. As I showed them on this video, they happen all the time simultaneously. So at any point, somebody is claiming, somebody else is rejecting, somebody falls asleep and gets a notification, some power user is assigned a job directly through the discarded service, and so on. And I guess that already at this point, you can imagine the amount of data that is flowing from this community towards our um, databases. It's an enormous amount of data. And by collecting this data and managing it, tracking it, analyzing it, we can make use of it in a way that we optimize our processes and make sure that the project is successful. So we gather a lot of data for translators. We know about their location or at least the reported geographical location because we don't track IP addresses and so on, but we know where the basis for the translator is collected during registration. We know their time zone coverage by looking at when they deliver files. We know their work distribution, whether they prefer to work on a weekend or a weekday, what their peak times are, how fast they are to claim jobs, what is their rejection timing, when do they reject, how much they reject. We know how fast they are to deliver their jobs. We know what is the percentage of jobs that uh, they de uh, have delayed and what are the percentage of jobs that they um, that they returned very quickly. We know their volume distribution over time. We know also what their quality is. We measure the quality through automation all the time. We even know how much effort translators put into translation, for example. 
uh, translation is basically mostly machine translation. So every translator has a suggestion coming from a machine how to translate every single sentence in the job. And the translators need to post edit this machine uh, translation, the suggestion, uh, in order to make it sound really fluent and human. Uh, translation and then we can measure the difference between the original machine translation and the final version of the sentence that the translator produced by changing and adapting the so-called post editing the machine translation and see how much effort the translator has put and we can correlate that effort with the time used to process the job. We can check the quality trends. We can even uh, we even track what are the most frequent errors, and we provide reports to the translators. This is what you do wrong um, most frequently, and uh, target the training so that they learn and stop doing it wrong. We can also see what percentage of the total volume for a given language, for example, Czech, an individual Czech translator translates. We want to avoid a scenario where one translator translates. 20% of or 50% of everything that there is, leaving the other translators without a job. And we can correlate such a behavior with the overall size of the community, how many translators we actually have in the community. Marina, you turned off your microphone, I believe. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, and what was the last thing you heard? Uh, uh, basically the pre previous uh, slide, I believe. Well, okay. it, it was like five seconds. I'm, okay. I'm not sure. OK, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, probably hit a shortcut somewhere. Yeah, so what I was saying on the previous slide, give me a second, is that all that data that you see here basically falls into three main areas of data-driven management. The first one is linguistic quality, through which we need to ensure correct language, accurate translations, adherence to terminology, and many other things. The second area is the and the health of the community pool. We need to make sure that uh, there is enough capacity within the community for every language. The community is stable. There is little attrition. People don't just come and go, come and go, and they need to, you know, and we need to train new translators over and over again, but they come and stay and are happy that there are no inactive translators who are just lurking around doing nothing. And the final area of data driven management is production. And here the purpose is very simple. We need to make sure that the jobs, the translations are delivered back to the client on time and safely. And because that's probably the easiest um, data driven uh, management area, I'm going to zoom in on that. And the rest of the lecture is going to be about production. And production means really deliver jobs on time. And in order to deliver jobs on time to the client, we need to meet a couple of conditions. Jobs must be claimed fast. If they don't get claimed on time, of course, there is, it's not possible to deliver them on time. So we need to track claim time data. Jobs must be delivered fast. So it's not enough to just claim it quickly, but you need to also deliver quickly. So we need to track delivery time data. And jobs must not be rejected late. If a job is claimed on time, say within just an hour after ending up up in the cloud, but then it's rejected just two minutes before the deadline, then of course nobody else will have the chance to translate it by the deadline. And there's one more phenomenon that we need to manage for, and this is the so-called stocking up with jobs or job hoarding, uh, where we, we by looking at data, we found out that trans some translators, not many of them, uh, luckily, have the tendency to just pick up all that there is. They just take a lot of work on themselves and then they find out that they don't have the capacity for that. And because because of that, they need to reject it and those jobs risk not to be delivered on time. And that's why by just tracking the data, we introduce a measure that I'm going to talk about um, um, until the rest of the talk, so I'm going to introduce it here and it's called claim limit. So remember that word claim limit because we are going to get back to it. It basically means not allowing a translator take more work that the translator can actually do. And now I'll go to two concrete user stories like use cases and show you how we work with data. 
So the first one is about um, extracting knowledge from data and managing deliveries, zooming in on claim, deliver and reject times. So we ask ourselves the question, when do translators claim, when do they deliver and when do they reject jobs when they do so? So we plotted the claiming data on a, on a chart which uses logarithmic functions. Let me maybe try to um, show you here. Yes, yeah, so you can see here you have the count of jobs on a logarithmic axis where the distance between 1 and 10 is the same as between 10 and 100 and 10 and 1000. Um, and here on the Y axis on the X axis on the horizontal one, you have seconds after publishing. And again, this is a logarithmic scale. So we have 1 to 10, 10 to 100, 10 to 1000, 10 to 10,000 um, seconds. So you can see immediately that thousands of jobs up here are claimed within the first 10, actually 100 seconds. So people are really very quick to claim. And then after the thousand seconds, it's like hundreds of jobs, but not thousands anymore. Remember, this is a logarithmic scale. So a point up here is thousand times bigger than a point lower there. So people are very quick to claim. How about delivery? How quick are they to deliver? Again, we plotted the data here on the vertical axis. You can see volume that is words, how many words of delivery we have of the jobs. And this is seconds after claiming. Um, normally, you know, as expected, nobody returns jobs one second after claiming it because after all, it needs to be translated. Surprisingly here, there are people or our jobs that are quite large, up to 1000 words, which are delivered within 10 seconds. So such cases are investigated one by one because this is a very interesting and uh, risky behavior. But you can see here that the bulk of the jobs are being delivered before the 100,000 seconds and after the, uh, I would say about fifth minute to um, about third hour. But the interesting parts are the outliers. So here is when the deadline comes, right? This is the time, this is the line which indicates the 40th hour. This is the deadline. And you can see here that there are jobs that are late. These are jobs that are returned after the deadline. So through automation, we catch those. We correlate them with the translators and those translators get li little reports created for themselves on a monthly basis and they get notifications and monthly reports. So every time they miss a deadline, they get a notification and they also get all this data summarized for themselves at the end of the month and a warning. Zooming in even more on a different type of data visualizations of which we have hundreds, I would say, we can see that 75 files, a percent of all files or jobs are claimed within the first hour after publishing. And if we zoom in even more, it's actually within the first five minutes. So it's clear now from the data, the community translators are really very quick to claim. But then let's turn to other types of behavior. How quick are they to, to reject? And when we look at rejection data on the lower chart, we see that again, most rejections happen in the first hour after claiming the job, which is wonderful, right? Because if you are really quick, if, if translators are really quick and they claim jobs within one hour and then they reject most of them within the next one hour, then we lose only two hours from the whole 40 hour deadline that we have. So that's very little risk. Unfortunately, there are jobs that are claimed just before the deadline. So here you can see count of files that are rejected just one hour before the deadline. And the question here is, why? Why were they rejected just one hour before the deadline? Is it that these jobs were claimed one hour and five minutes before the deadline? And then after five minutes, the translator rejected them. So the translator was very quick to reject them. Or is it that they were uh, claimed much earlier? And we can make the correlation and we can find out that out of those files that were rejected just one hour before the deadline, 74% of them were actually claimed within the first hour after publish. So the translator claimed one hour after to publish and rejected the job one hour before the deadline. Why? Typically because the translator realizes that she or he cannot deliver by the deadline and returns the job to auction. But that also means that 
these translators that get filtered here, um, <clears throat> they're anonymized for you, but not for us. They've been sitting on the jobs for at least 38 hours before rejecting them. And this is a very risky behavior, and you wouldn't be surprised probably to hear that they get their monthly report and notifications and uh, the warnings. And if their behavior doesn't change, then they um, they um, get additional measures. For example, their claim limits, the amount of work that they can do, uh, gets reduced significantly because of this risky behavior. But based on this data, we can now answer the question that we asked ourselves during the video, namely, why did the translator for language circle reject a job? Looking at when most job rejections happen, namely during the first hour after claiming a job, we can conclude that translators reject jobs, not because something horrible happened and it always happens during the first hour after claim. There is no Murphy law like that, thankfully, but because they take the job, they open it, they look at it, they maybe even start working on it a bit, and then they realize they don't want to do that. They don't enjoy it. It's too difficult. It's not their favorite type of content, and that's why they reject it. So we know that from the data because we know that most rejections happen actually the first five minutes after claiming a job. So obviously this is because the translators took the job, had a look at it, decided they didn't want to work on it and rejected it. And how can we use this knowledge? Well, it will be much more efficient if we actually allow translators to preview the job before claiming it so that they make up their mind and decide whether they want to work on that job or not claim it, not after they claim it, so that they have to reject it. I can hear some noise. Is there a question? No. I think that someone just left yes. their microphone on. <laughs> yeah, OK, no problem. So here is an example of how we can use data in order to identify a pattern in translator behavior and then use this knowledge in order to improve our tools and make life easier for translators and reduce risk for the company and for the client. But then the question is, if rejections are so bad and if they constitute risk for missing deadlines and if people reject one hour before the deadline, why don't we just prohibit them? Why do we actually allow reject, uh, translators to reject? I mean, this is not something that uh, many crowdsourcing platforms have you know a uber driver cannot just reject to drive you to the to the airport once uh, uh, he or she has accepted the job well bad idea and the reason it's bad idea is because you can imagine a translator who picked up a job and then just found themselves incapable of finishing it for some reason or another maybe really something urgent happened and the translator simply doesn't have capacity anymore and if this translator is not allowed to return the job then the delay for that job is going to be huge. Maybe translator got sick and needs a week to recover. Then this job would be delayed for a week. And that's why we thought it's bad to prohibit people from rejecting jobs. It's going to actually affect the deadlines much worse than if we allow them to reject jobs. But then we thought, why don't we allow them to reject until one hour after claim only or five hour after claim only? Just just not allow them to reject any time. Well, again, that's not a very good idea because um, there are translators who claim jobs or rather there are jobs which are in the cloud on the platform and they have a deadline in one hour or in 30 minutes. Now, if a translator takes a job that has a deadline in 30 minutes, but has one hour to reject, then the translator can still reject that job 30 minutes after the deadline. And that's exactly the situation we want to reach to uh, avoid. So then we thought, OK, then we are going to introduce a dynamic rejection period. The closer the deadline is at the time when the translator picks the job, the less time there will be for rejecting it. And if the translator rejects outside of the allowed period, that gives the translator a penalty point, a black point. So we introduced this dynamic rejection period, which basically said, OK, if you claim a file and there are 
35 hours until the deadline, you have one hour to reject. If there are two hours until the deadline, you have 15 minutes to reject. And if you reject outside of those allowed periods, you get a penalty point. But then again, we continued observing the data and we found out that the translators have found a loophole. There were translators which would do the following. They would claim a job and just before the allowed rejection period is over, they would reject the job and then go back to the platform and claim it immediately. Again, a new rejection period starts running and just before it's over, the translator would reject the file and then go back and claim it immediately. So in effect, the translator would have the job on their end all the time. Nobody else can claim it, but still it is possible for that translator to to reject that job just before the deadline, totally unpunished without generating any penalty points. So then we started monitoring the total blockage time per each translator. So we were measure, we started measuring the total time during which a translator had a job on their side before rejecting it for the last time. So basically now in order to um, monitor rejection behavior and manage it, we we monitor counter files rejected outside the allowed time. We monitor the total, total blockage time. We monitor the times between claim and rejects, and we generate warnings. We, um, we generate monthly reports. The best thing is the translators themselves see all that data on their personal page that they have on the platform. So when they log into Fluently, they actually see that data and um, they are getting warnings if they don't um, if they don't uh, follow the allowed uh, rejection times and if they persist in that there are measures taken and the measures we take as i already mentioned are the so-called claim limit reduction so let me just give you an example here we have three translators the black bars show you claim jobs the green bars show you deliver jobs and the red bar shows you rejected jobs so here we have translator number two who claims a lot and rejects Two thirds of what the translator has claimed, and translator three sitting with no jobs, to, no jobs to claim, maybe has enough sub capacity to translate those jobs that translator took, uh, two took but never delivered. So what we do then is we watch how much translator two actually delivers, and set a claim limit for this translator to reflect the actual capacity, the actual volume of work done, so that this translator cannot stock up with work that the translator then needs to reject because after all deadline is deadline and we need to make everything possible to meet the deadline still keeping the freedom of translators to claim when they want and to reject if they have to and just so that it doesn't sound to you too um, too strict translators are still allowed to reject a given percentage of their jobs um, outside of the allowed rejection time without generating penalty points so it's not uh, nothing uh, they have the freedom to do that because we know that sometimes it's really necessary, but they shouldn't exceed 5%. They shouldn't, um, they shouldn't reject um, outside of the allocated rejection period more than, um, say, no, for more than five jobs out of 100. So that was the first user story that I wanted to share with you, and I'm glad I have time for the second one. Uh, and that is about our so-called discarded service. So if you remember from that video, we had some jobs that were not claimed within the 10 hours that we want them to be claimed. And we had the discarded job. We have the discarded job service that takes those jobs and automatically assigns to specific translators called power users with whom we have specific agreement. All those jobs that are not claimed 10 hours after publishing. And I don't know whether you ask yourself that question, but the question is why 10 hours? Why not 12 and why not five? And again, you won't be surprised to learn that the reason it's 10 hours is because of data, right? This is not just the number we decided to come up with, but that's the number that emerged from the data. So to, in order to decide the optimal period, we first looked at when jobs come to fluently. When are they actually coming from the client? And we found out that there are peak times. So there is a peak time. You can see this number, uh, which is 18.3. There is this peak time, which is at about 3 a.m. in Central Europe. In East China, this peak time is about 10 a.m. 
And in North America, in US, New York, it is about 10 p.m. in the evening. So the peak time for Czech translators is just because before they wake up. For Chinese translators is when they're fully up and working. And for the North American translators, the peak time comes just before they go to bed. So now for jobs that are published at this time, what should be the optimal waiting period before discarded service kicks in? Well, we calculated that if it's 10 hours, then the jobs will be discarded at this time. When these jobs published during the peak get assigned to specific power users, then the check power users will be will have noon, so they'll be working. The Chinese power users will have still some part left of their day, right? It's going to be evening, but they still have time to finish the job. And the American power users will have just started their workday. If we have a shorter discarded period, for example, eight hours, then the files will be taken away from the auction. They'll be taken away from fluently and sent to specific translators before that community has actually managed to wake up because the American community of translators, they will just sleep through the whole time. And if we discard later, then the Chinese power users will have gone to bed. So 10 hour waiting period was just the perfect one that is going to cover most of the time zones. But should it be 10 hours for all languages? Actually, no. Once you look at languages, you see they pattern differently when it comes to claiming. For example, here we have language A, and you can see that people claim mostly by the 10th hour when discarded service kicks in, but in reality, because of rejections, they keep claiming all the time until the 30th hour. And here comes another language B, where everything's gone by the fifth hour. So after the fifth hour, every job that was there available is claimed. So then it would be much better to have discarded service for language A starting from the 15th hour, for example, because the translators from that community are slow to pick up the jobs. And for language B, we can have discarded service kicking in from the sixth hour because the community is very active. So if there is here at the sixth hour some file that is not picked up yet, well, obviously nobody wants to pick it up, so then we'd better send it to somebody and assign directly. And then the next question is, OK, we have language A and we have language B, but we have language C, D, E, F, G and another 70 languages. Do we need a unique discarded service setup for every language? Again, the answer is no, because after we did our um, analysis of data, we we could cluster the languages into patterns. So this is the group of languages which exhibit the language A claiming pattern. And this is the group of languages which exhibit the language B claiming pattern. So we can actually group the discarded service into language clusters and just have five different ones instead of 70. And the next question is, should it run at all times? And the answer is again, no. And it comes from data and from community data. Here we have our one German power user, one of those translators who uh, get assigned files that nobody else wants and translate them for us. And you can clearly see that this translator has an active period before noon, has a sleeping period when she doesn't deliver anything. There are no circles, which means no work is being taken or delivered. So this is the night. And she also has a passive period um, between half past two and half past four. And I, because I, I've been chatting with this translator, I think she picks up her kids from nursery at this point uh, in the afternoon and she's with her children. So she doesn't pick up any jobs and she doesn't deliver any jobs. This is one power user we have for German. Then we have another power user for German who lives in the US and you can see that his active period is when this one is sleeping in the night. So the second one is actually active and when the second one in the US is asleep, then we have some overlap with the activity uh, by the first one. 
And then when we take all these active and passive periods and resting periods, we can adjust the discarded service so that it takes into consideration the active periods of the power users, because there is no point in assigning a file that nobody claims in auction to a power user who is inactive, who is asleep. This is just wasting time. Such a file better stay in auction because somebody else can pick it up. And while the power user, if this is if the if the power user gets the file during the inactive period, there is a guarantee that this file won't be won't be translated. So we started adjusting the discarded service in a way that it takes into consideration the active and inactive periods so that we do not make or the automation doesn't assign anything that is discarded to somebody who is inactive. And the good thing about this is that we didn't have to go and ask translators, when do you sleep? And when are you unavailable? In fact, they may not even know they have this pattern of delivery uh, unless they look at their own data on the on their website uh, influently. But we just had to look at the data and by looking at the data, we answered that question. When do you work and when don't you work? We answered many other questions when we analyzed the properties of jobs that are discarded. So we found out that it's important what date of the week we have for discarded service on Fridays. There were many more files that were discarded, obviously because on Fridays people tend to pick up less work for the weekend. It depended on the size of the job. You might be surprised, but the really small ones with low word counts, for example, a translation of four words, those were the ones who were being discarded, probably because translators just don't think it's worth the effort to pick up a job that has only four words. I mean, how much money are you going to make translating four words? So the solution is, batch small jobs into big jobs so that people claim the big job and then they will have a couple of small files to translate in there. It depends on content type, so difficult uh, translations which are very context dependent, which are not just text, but there is some multimedia pictures, screenshots and so on. They were discarded more often than others, so we started working on improving the preview feature so that it's easier for translators to translate such jobs. And we looked also at time of publishing and found out that jobs that are published at the end of the workday uh, have a higher risk of being discarded. So we started introducing variable waiting time so that if a job is published in the morning, then it gets discarded in the afternoon. But if a job is published in the evening, it doesn't get discarded just after midnight. It actually waits to be discarded when the translators have woken up at around eight o'clock in the morning. So we have variable waiting time. So these are our two examples of how we use data in order to have a fully data-driven management and manage this community. And despite all the freedom that translators have in order when it comes to deciding whether to pick a job, deciding whether to reject it or not, we manage the project in a way that we have a very, very small, tiny percentage of jobs that are actually not being delivered on time, close to zero, which is a great success. But when we look at the data, we found out something else which was very interesting, and I thought I'm just going to share it with you uh, at the end of this presentation. And that is the question. What do our community translators have in common with thunderstorms and wealth distribution and so on? And I don't know whether you've heard about the Pareto's law. It is a law which is also called the 80-20 rule. It basically says that 80% of the consequences are caused by 20% of the causes. For example, 80% of the crimes are caused by 20% of the criminals. And 80% of the income across the world is uh, going to 20% of the population. And 80% of the usage of language of English language employs only 20% of its words. So there are some words which are much more frequent than others. And 80% of the damages caused by thunderstorms are caused by only 20% of the thunderstorms. And when we look at the data, we found out that when it comes to our community translations, then 80% of the volumes are 80% of the jobs are translated by 20% of the translators. And this may sound like a nice to know 
And yeah, it's very curious that translators and thunderstorms have something in common. But in fact, this has big uh, implications because if we identify those 20% of translators who deliver 80% of the work, then we can focus on improving them. We can focus on special trainings for them, um, teaching them how to provide better translations, how to use terminology better, and by just focusing on uh, one fifth of the community, we are going to impact the quality of four fifths of our deliveries. So even such um, trivia and uh, seemingly uninteresting facts coming from data actually help us manage the community better. And yeah, I hope that with this um, lecture, I have convinced you how interesting it is to actually uh, look at data, uh, work with big data, analyze it, and how um, useful it is um, for managing a very practical everyday project, such as delivering translations uh, for an IT giant. Thank you very much for your attention. And now I am really looking forward to uh, hearing your questions. Thank you so much for your lecture. I think it was truly fascinating insight to your everyday work. Uh, there are some questions, so let's get to them. First question is what language level would I need to work in localization as a translator? And if there are any other requ requirements for the job? Um, you don't need to be a professional linguist. Um, so you just need to be fluent uh, in um, your native language. Doesn't really have to be your native language, but usually you have the proficiency within your native language. And when you apply as a community translator, you need to take a language test. If you pass that test, then you can start working on a project. Uh, projects have different uh, so-called quality levels. So you can start as a basic translator doing a certain quality level and then get uh, promoted to a standard quality translator and find Finally, premium quality translator. So you can grow uh, within the community as you learn to translate better. Um, it also depends on what kind of project you apply for. So there are uh, very specialized translations, for example, for software, uh, for technical software, where just speaking the language is not enough. One needs to understand, to be a bit more technical, understand the terminology and so on. But there are projects where it's actually enough to just speak the language and know how to write correctly, uh, which in the case of Czech seems to me is not that trivial, but uh, yeah, just know the language well, and then you pass the test, you start translating and that's sufficient. So the short answer is anybody who is fluent and proficient in a given language can work as a translator, but um, then you would be directed to the right project for you, depending on your proficiency level. OK, thank you so much. Um, well, since you mentioned the quality or and like difficulty of different different products for translating, we will go to the next question, which is if do you think that there are, and there is any field which is not suitable for crowdfunding localization, for example, video games or products which are story based or something which needs really strong expertise in the field? Um, video games is excellent for crowd localizations because typically then is the people who play who also translate. Uh, people who play, they are they are um, very often part of uh, gamer communities and they have the community spirit in them. So my point from my point of view and from my practice actually with game localization, I would say that um, game translating games uh, and videos is uh, connecting to games. It's just perfectly suitable for a crowd localization model. Um, one um, area where I'd be a bit more careful is in life sciences when it comes to translating, for example, leaflets for medicines. The reason is that a mistake there can be can can have really dire consequences. It can be lethal, right? So if you make a mistake in the translation of the dosage, uh, the person who follows that leaflet and those instructions can end up in hospital or with even worse consequences. So um, such, um, such content 
uh, is probably the least suitable for crowd localization and very uh, high level legal content where you need to really make sure that uh, you translate very accurately, uh, for example, contracts, uh, because again, there a mistake can end up with a lawsuit. Um, but for any project, the most important aspect is the quality gate at the end. Um, you can even have medical leaflets translated by community if you then have a next step of high quality review and the professionalism of the reviewers will be the one that will determine your final quality. In other words, everything can be translated by community, but uh, perhaps um, for more complicated contents, the delivery will have one more step before it reaches the client, and that would be the step of the so-called quality assurance and second, third review to make sure that any mistake that is there uh, is removed before the final delivery. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your answer. Uh, another question, can you guarantee that translation presented to clients are as good or better than from agency? Do you have quality control processes? <laughs> yeah, thanks for the really nice questions. Actually, I'd say they might be even better. And there is, an, there is a, a good reason for that. So who do you think that the agencies use? I mean, it's the same people who have become members of the community. It's not different people. So the difference is for the translator, whether they will provide their services through an agency or they will provide their services directly by uh, registering for a translation platform and having more direct access to the job. So I haven't noticed any difference uh, between um, um, or rather I'd say that the quality of uh, translation with community is no lower and in some cases higher than the one provided by uh, translations, not only because most likely we work with the same people, but also because quality monitoring is much easier. So with an agency, as I mentioned, when we find out that, for example, translations for a certain language don't meet the quality criteria, we don't know who is the precise translator who made the mistakes. We know there were mistakes and these are the mistakes, so we send a report of all the mistakes, but we don't know who did them. Now, with the community model, <clears throat> there is full transparency. So we not only know what the mistakes are, we know who did them. And then we can take measures. We can say, you did that many mistakes, we warn you for the third time, so now we're going to reduce your claim limit or expel you from the community. So quality management is much more direct and transparent as a result of what, which quality is actually better. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, it comes to my mind a question. How often are you forced to actually expel someone from the community? Uh, very rarely because it's only um, uh, kind of a uh, last resort measure before expelling somebody from community. So we expel from community only those people who really don't care about improving or and most probably most in most cases this is because of um, uh, production behavior, delayed deliveries, people who delay deliveries all the time. Um, not that much because of quality, but that has also happened. But before expelling somebody from community, we first need to have three failed quality assurance reviews. So we, the translator must fail in their reviews. Um, they must have not reacted to our improvement measures, not improved, say, terminology adherence, uh, not taken additional courses and quizzes and testings, and uh, just be very persistent in, uh, in failing either in quality or in delivery. And then after reducing their claim limit significantly, we in the end need to expel them. But happens really rarely. I wouldn't say more than uh, one per uh, three months. And we're talking here community of thousands of people. OK, thank you. Um, another question which was maybe already partially answered. Uh, how do you final check of uh, the final translation, like if you can uh, maybe describe the process a little yes. more in detail. Yes, um, so 
in our community, we have layers. We have uh, it's a hierarchical community. That's why we actually call it community and not a crowd. So you have translators who provide standard quality, translators who provide premium quality, power users who do more things than just translating. You know, they, they are the ones taking care of discarded service, but they also can review other people's translations. And then we, for every language, we have a language owner who is like a really professional, long time linguist who's been working on the project and knows it inside out and for translators from standard premium quality and power users we have reviewers who review their translations and uh, so we run a so-called review service which is an automated service that randomly selects samples from a particular translator uh, and sends them for review and the translator doesn't know exactly which job will be reviewed, when there will be a review and so on. And uh, the service takes those samples, sends them for review, then gets back the results. And based on the results, this service calculates when will be the next time the service will take a sample and from what type of content. If a translator keeps having low scores from those reviews, then the next review will be scheduled much earlier. But if a translator has excellent passing scores, say three times in a row, then it's obviously a translator who has very basic, uh, very stable quality. And then the next review can happen in two months or th even three months because there is no reason to doubt the quality of this translator. So to estimate the quality, we basically have an automation that selects samples uh, on an individual schedule for an for every single translator and sends them automatically to reviewers. Reviewers get those jobs. They claim them just like people can claim translation jobs. You can claim review jobs, review the files, submit them back, and then everything again happens by automation. Scores are calculated and the next cycle for quality evaluation review is scheduled. And then, of course, there is a project manager within RWS Moravia who monitors the dashboards. And if a translator has uh, higher, uh, has too many consecutive failed scores, then the project manager gets a notification. Here there is a translator who is not delivering the right quality and starts communicating with this translator, looking how to help the translator improve and following basically up with this translator. So in this case, a human doesn't need to monitor thousands of people and ten thousands of reviews, but just gets the 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 tool extracts those that really need to be followed up with by the human uh, so that the manual effort and the human effort is reduced. Is the review process different for like, um, let's say, really complicated topics or topics that uh, require like high knowledge of the of the expert terminology? You mentioned life sciences, <coughs> maybe some other topics as well. Um, there are different processes and there are different thresholds. So for different qualities, you need to get different type, like different basically grades um, uh, on your evaluation and um, there are also different processes. You may have a process where you you have translate only, so you translate and then you deliver and that's it. But there are also processes where one translator translates and then another one has to do the proofreading and the editing because you know that very often mistakes are not caught by the person who made them because your brain just writes over them, right? You just don't see them and somebody else needs to give it a second pass. So that's a different type of process. And then there are processes when one person translates, another person proofreads and the third person comes in and reviews to make sure that there are no mistakes in the final um, quality. It depends on the type of project and the type of content. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there are some questions that are dedicated more to um, like day to day aspects, I would say. Yeah. Uh, so first of them, uh, how long are the typical files for the translation on average? You mentioned that there are like very, very yes, yes, short yes. for words. Yeah. So what is like the typical length, let's say? Yeah. Uh, now, I don't know. It, like last time I checked, over 85% of the files were less than 500 words. 
So that's the most accurate answer I can give at that point without opening a dashboard and looking at the data. Uh, so files uh, jobs are typically not very large. Uh, again, depends on the project as if you remember that teams screenshot, right? So you can get um, of a job which has only the words in the in the menu on the left side where you get I don't know activity chats you know so this is going to be seven words right but seven very important words so it's very important to get those right because if you translate into check something like tasks in as assignment instead of task it's it makes a enormous difference uh, but other files can be a really uh, typically files are like 100 to 100 words uh, again depends on the project now I'm talking IT translations but if you for example are a translator again for IT who translates um, help help content for example articles then it's typically much longer these are the articles that you will get on the web where you ask something like how do I insert a screenshot in word and then you get a text, right? And that's long. This can be up to 1000 words. And we've seen jobs that are 10,000 words. Okay, and those have you. their own issues, right? Because 10,000 words you cannot translate within 48 hours. Obviously, you are going to miss the deadline, but obviously you shouldn't be penalized for missing the deadline because it wouldn't be realistic to expect the translator to, do, to translate so much. So for those, we have our own data, which I wasn't showing today, own calculations and own way of correlating expected productivity and uh, how realistic it is to deliver a file within deadline so that we know whether to count it or not count it as a missed deadline and so on. OK, thank you. Um, it really actually brought another question in my mind, which is if you have this kind of job, just like let's say words in some kind of software or app, uh, how do you make sure that, like do you provide any con uh, context to the uh, translators? For example, yes. how do you make sure that what uh, the, the words which they translate, they match yes. the icon, let's say, or that oh, yes. it matches yes. what, what the button actually does, etc. You know, you just nailed it. Um, that's the best question to ask, and this is the hardest thing about IT translations. English is a very difficult language to translate from because I, I call it, it's a language which with low semantic resolution. So, for example, you get these icons and they say view, or you get a, a job and it has one word and it is view, and you do not know whether this is a verb, meaning to see something, or if this is an icon, which is like it's a noun, it's a view. And you had have we have a lot of that in IT translations. Um, that's why jobs which are very context dependent and they lack the context are usually discarded. They're, they're not wanted by translators because the translator doesn't want to spend um, 10 minutes thinking what kind of view are we talking here about and then get paid for translating just one one word. It just doesn't pay off. But luckily this is a known problem. So every IT string is accompanied by something called developer comment. So the person who wrote that line in the code, the person who wrote that string uh, attaches to it instructions which explain what it actually means in what context that word is going to appear. So if you have activity and it's a Teams icon, then it will have to it attached a instruction, which is then shown to you when you translate, and it says activity. This is the icon which appears in Teams. Not only that, but we have also a terminology database, so you cannot translate activity just the way you think it should be. You have to translate it the way it's translated officially, because it's a term. And then there is a term base, which is so there is a check which pulls out the terms and actually gives you a suggestion in the tool where you translate uh, influently, which says this is activity in English. It means this and this. And here is how it is translated in the term base. This is the approved term translation of this term. And the only thing you need to do is verify that all three are kind of hang together. Click on the suggestion by the term base, and then you will automatically insert the translation um, into the right place. So it sounds very difficult, but this is a known problem. So that's why we have all those additional support tools that help translators to actually translate right. 
OK, thank you so much for the answer. Uh, let's go to the student questions again. Uh, there is a question. What are the typical clients of Fluently? You mentioned software, so are there any other examples of typical clients? Unfortunately, I cannot answer this because I'm under NDA, so uh, clients don't want to reveal their suppliers, so I can only stay vague and say um, it's giant big corporations. Uh, it's um, yeah, um, they are varied, right? But I cannot name the I cannot name them for you uh, in this forum, unfortunately. Maybe just what kind of field, let's say, if it's all IT or mostly IT or no, it's not only IT, it can be different projects and different clients actually do different things. So it's not only about um, just pure translation. It can be any, it's uh, various jobs that are using uh, humans, human, um, human um, workforce, uh, intellectual human workforce. So it can be review, it can be human judgment, uh, verification of um, um, MT, for example, uh, even just verifying that uh, something is translated into the right language. For example, you can have a company that provides machine translation and most wants to make sure that um, uh, the machine determines correctly the language into which it has to translate and wants to have that language verified by somebody who really speaks it. Yeah. So there are many different uh, types of jobs. Thank you. Uh, another question. Uh, if I had a company, which platform? I, I think they mean like company with similar scope, let's say. Uh, which platform will you recommend to provide crowdfunded localization? According to your presentation, I think it might be a huge system with many subsystems and analytic tools. I am not sure I understand the question. So is it like if you had a company? No, I, I, I'm afraid I don't understand it. Mm. So I believe if I have a company which needs to get something done by crowdfunding, mm -hmm, I guess. Mm -hmm. So how would how should I do it? Like um, which platform should I use? Uh, if you as a company want to provide, want to make use of crowdsourcing for a certain service. I believe uh, so, yeah. Yeah, well, you need to choose the crowdsourcing platform that actually matches your service, right? Uh, and typically companies build their own crowdsourcing platforms, but uh, you can contract a company that has a crowdsourcing platform. So if you want to do translations, um, then using crowdsourcing, then you need to either contract a company that provide, has a crowdsourcing platform, the company I work for has one, but this is not the only one company that has a crowdsourcing platform or you need to build your own, but then you need to manage all this translation on your own. But if you have a company that uh, has something like different type of service, for example, uh, testing, uh, you can then you then need to uh, work with a crowdsourcing platform for testing. So if you are a software developer and you want people to test your software, uh, then Fluently is not your your uh, uh, platform, then you need to go and uh, work with one of those platforms that provides uh, crowdsourced testing. OK, thank you. Uh, another question, how do you analyze collected data? What tools do you use? <clears throat> yeah, so we use various uh, tools um, for collecting data analyzing data and visualizing the analysis. So these are three different uh, components. Data collection is um, built into the tools. So the tools need to keep history. So as, as the work happens in that tool, the tools need to have specific workflows and keep history of everything that happens or of the important events that happen in that tool and 
push all that information of the tracked history and all the events into a database. The database needs to be structured in a way that, um, that it uh, organizes the data in a way that then the data can be extracted and work with. There are different databases out there. For example, SQL, you can use SQL uh, or SQL or Mongo. The, the, they are structured in a different way, so everybody needs to decide what is the best database uh, uh, to be used and that's where the data is stored. Once the data is stored, you need to build the next layer and that is uh, extracting the data that you need, combining it together in a, in a way that it makes sense and processing it with statistical methods so that outliers, for example, are excluded because they just um, uh, they are noise in the data, so they won't be useful for any data analysis. So there needs to be a statistical evaluation done on the data uh, so that uh, it uh, doesn't have noise and it makes sense and it's correlated correctly. And the last step is uh, build a visual. So build all those charts and pictures uh, and show them on a dashboard so that the data can be easily interpreted by a human. And in some cases there is an extra step and that is build an automation to alert for certain types of uh, behavior um, or, um, or data. For example, you have a um, you have uh, delivery um, data about deliveries and you want to be alerted for any time a particular translator uh, or for any translator who has missed more than 10% of the deadlines. Just to get a notification email, there are these people and you need to send them an email and tell them that uh, they should be more strict with their deadline. Okay, thank you. Uh, now there are more like personal questions, I would say. Uh, there's a question about your PhD degree in Norway. Uh, Maybe <laughs> uh, someone is uh, curious about how was it and if it's useful for your work. So oh, maybe yes. um, if you like your background in linguistics actually help yeah. you with your job now. Yeah, my PhD was useful in two ways. Uh, first of all, from a linguistic point of view, it was very useful because I worked in a center of excellence where um, it was very much in the north, very close to the North Pole, actually the northernmost university in the world. You can Google it, it's Tromsø. And I worked there in a, a center of excellence where we were exploring lots of languages. Um, uh, in fact, we were a group of researchers where just within that group, there were more than 40 individual languages spoken. Uh, so basically everybody was from a different country speaking a different language. And that gave me a very wide overview over the languages around the world. I myself speak a lot of languages and also I got to kind of get the idea of uh, about another, I don't know how many languages, how they work in general. Just for my thesis, I had to read uh, grammars for about 70 languages. So I, I got an idea what every language kind of or like the main languages kind of look like you know not speak them but know about their grammar a bit about their phonology so when i then moved to localization it was a fantastic thing because uh, the first project I worked on, I worked on this project as a linguist. I don't work as a linguist anymore, as you might have noticed, but I worked as a linguist. Uh, so then it was very easy for me to understand when a Korean translator says, um, I cannot translate that, it just, you know, it's not doesn't work in Korean, this sentence. And then a German translator sends me a note and then, um, I don't know, a Quechua translator sends me a note. I'm like, yeah, I know what you're actually talking about. So that was very useful to give you an idea of the problems that a uh, simple task like translation can actually uh, have for some languages where it turns out that a very easy thing like translating the word green is not possible. Uh, but what was even more important is that um, it gave me the right attitude to work in the sense that as a PhD student and as a master student as well, you may face situations when you're doing research where you need to find the answer of a question and nobody knows that answer. So in school, when we learn, we, we kind of we are asked things by the teachers and we know that the teacher knows the answer, right? So it's about giving the right answer. That is the answer which is identical to the answer that the teacher thinks is correct. But as a researcher, you have a question and you don't know the answer and you don't know whether anybody knows that answer and you need to find it entirely on your own. So you need to have the courage to ask yourself those questions and then start pursuing 
finding the answer and you need to learn to deal with failure because you may have a question. How does that work? Then you have a hypothesis. You start working on it in like um, for example, you want to confirm the hypothesis, you're doing your experiments, you're doing your research, and then after six months of heavy work and sleepless nights, you find out that I was wrong. And the human instinct is to say, no, 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 I invested six months into that. I'm not giving up, but you have to. And you have to start doing your, taking your next steps, starting from zero and starting again to find the answer. So I find myself very often during my work in a situation we have a problem. We need to find the answer. Nobody knows it. We don't know it. We have to research it. We're doing a lot of research, like really not scientific research, not academic, but real life research, working with people. We have a hypothesis. Um, we, for, just to give you a concrete example, we had a hypothesis. Um, files that get rejected are the ones that get discarded. OK, hypothesis, let's confirm it. Look at the data. Turn out this is plain wrong. 90% of files that get discarded never get claimed by anybody. So it is not that rejections cause discarded volumes. So it was this academic training that I got that allows me to really drive the project forward because of not being intimidated by the fact that uh, the answer may not is, exist out there, but it needs to be found. And also being able to say, OK, we spent one month on this, doesn't work. We try something else. So I'd recommend really, I'm a big fan of higher education and PhD, even if you end up working something completely different, just the training, the academic training creates this very useful attitude towards uh, not being afraid to research and kind of relying on your intellectual um, capabilities and just trying to find the answer to your questions. OK, thank you so much. Uh, well, there are not more students questions, so I would just wrap up with one last question because maybe someone might be interested after listening our lecture to actually pursue a similar job as you do. So if you can tell us a little bit like what is actually your role in all the processes you described to us and if um, like what might be the requirements, let's say, for people who possibly would like to do the same job as you yep. do. Well, my job is basically the job of a team leader because I'm, of course, haven't done this all myself. I have a very large team and my team has different so it's mini teams within it. So there are there is a part of the team which does quality management, part of the team that does uh, automation and tool developments, uh, one team that does BI data analysis and so on, uh, and also production. Um, so the team is not very large by itself, but it has the key people in it. And uh, my job is to make connections between them, generate ideas, make them work together so that uh, some when production are aware of some type of issue by production, I mean those people who really need to make sure that files are delivered on time, can chase the translators and so on. Then the BI people who do the data analysis and build the visualization know about it and together we can come up with a solution so that um, when some translators are really fast to deliver, but then it turns out that their quality is slow because they're just basically copy pasting machine translation or something like that, then we can make the quality team to work with the production team and the BI team to create the right visualization and data analysis so that we can catch such a behavior quickly. So my work is basically to um, generate and help implement ideas that uh, um, that allow us to drive this huge project with not that many people actually just by smart uh, background automations and analysis uh, and my official position i think is called something like a group manager but uh, i think of myself more like um, um innovator like uh, somebody who is pushing towards innovative thinking um, and uh, team leader, uh, somebody who inspires people to talk to each other, come up with a solution. And in fact, we start our day 
every single day with half an hour meeting, which is a brainstorming meeting when everybody says today I want to do this and this. And yesterday I had such and such problem. And then somebody says, oh, but I can help you with your problem. Yeah, that's how we do it. You know, just give me 30 minutes. I'll write a script for it and you don't have that problem anymore. So it's a very nice uh, working environment and the team is very varied. There are linguists, there are BI specialists, there are people who've studied something completely different, uh, economics and so on. So um, the good thing about localization is that um, anybody can do that work. If it's a passion, it's like, uh, what is common among these people is that everybody likes that job. There is something very catchy uh, with this job. Maybe it's the communication with the translators who are all over the world and you get to hear uh, very interesting stories and talk to people from um, places that you may never um, visit. Um, but um, it's a, I would say it's a job for anybody who is interesting in it. You don't need a special education. Of course, linguistic will help uh, and uh, I guess uh, some knowledge of data and technology will help, but it's not a necessity. Anybody who simply has the right attitude and willingness to learn is also uh, can also be very successful in that job. OK, thank you so much for your answer. Also for the whole presentation, uh, it was really, really interesting. Um, I'm sure that everyone enjoyed it as, as I did. And thank you so much. And um, let's hope we'll have a chance to, I don't know, cross paths again. Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice questions and for your attention. It was a pleasure for me. Thank you. This was for us. Okay. Goodbye. Bye bye.